Hey guys, we're back with another video teaching you the basics of Pokemon Unite. Now we've already gone over the basics of Tempo, the basics of your roles, and the basics of the early game. This one is a little different this time. This is aimed a little more at people playing with their friends, but you can also transition this into your solo queue games, of course. And that is going to be the basics of team building. Now what do I mean by team building? So team building is going to be the five Pokemon you're going to want to run to form your team composition. Now the way this translates into your solo queue games is you can look at the character select and you can see, hmm, what could I pick here that would make this team better. Now I'm going to do my best to not speak about specific Pokemon because metas do change, but the answer to that question is most likely not Lane Froakie. Now before I go on, I just want to mention that 64% of you still aren't subscribed, so please, if you could hit that subscribe button, it would mean the world to me. I love making this style of content for you guys, and I really want to be able to keep doing this full time. When you're putting together a team composition, you really want to think about what everything brings to the table. Synergy is really important here as well. How does it all work together and what do these Pokemon offer each other? You need to consider what your team is going to look like throughout every stage of the game. If you're running an attacker in the bottom lane that doesn't scale too late in the game, say something like a Venusaur, Bulbasaur doesn't have the greatest lane pressure, it doesn't clear very well, it hasn't got the greatest secure but you could run something like a Snorlax or a Blissey pairing with that in the lane to support it and help it get that experience that it wouldn't be able to otherwise. Now this applies for every Pokemon in a similar category. Anything that struggles to secure in the early game will want a lane partner that can secure better than it can to help it get that early game experience. You could pair almost anything with a Lucario and the lane would go fine, just please not lane Froki. When you pick a Pokemon, you want to make sure it's fulfilling a certain role. If you want information on that, please go watch the roles video I made. This basic series is going to be something covering everything and all these videos are going to tie in together. So please make sure you're keeping up to date if you have any questions. Now that we have a basic understanding of the fact that our lanes need to work together, they need to have some synergy, they need to be able to possibly win the lane, let's talk about our junglers. Now the jungler is something that you will pick based around your entire team composition. It will really be filling a necessary role. At the moment, most people are picking Glaceon because it's incredibly broken, but as I said, metas will change. Sometimes you've had Cinderace here, Dragonite here. It's essentially the Pokemon you want to feed the most experience to and can make the biggest impact in the vital points of the game. Dragonite was the meta because objectives were so important at Remote Stadium, which means that Dragonite getting ahead meant you could secure those objectives over the other team, and it would cause you to snowball and therefore win the game. Objectives are still important on this map, just not as important as they used to be. And that's why you see Dragonite fall out of the meta a little at the moment. Now, a lot of junglers have different power spikes, so it's really important to keep these in mind when you're choosing it based on your composition. If you're going to choose a jungler like, say, Venusaur, your level 5 is not incredible, so your first gank on a lane is not going to be too impactful, but your late game, once you're fed that experience, is going to be incredible. Now, if you pick a jungler like Absol, your early game is going to be amazing. Your first gank is going to be feared, and you're going to be able to snowball a lane really well. But if you fall behind, you're really going to feel that, and you're really going to suffer. You need to understand what your team is trying to do, and you need to enable your win conditions. Because that's something that people don't seem to take in mind. You need to create a win condition. If your team's win condition is something like a Cinderace, then you don't want to build four other late game scalers. You want to build something that can help enable Cinderace get where it needs to be. That's why you see a lot of teams build lanes where the early game is so incredibly strong because they can carry through till the late game scaler comes online and can then carry the game and become that win condition that they're meant to be. Picking four attackers is 99.99% of the time the wrong way to build your team composition. Even in your solo queue games, everyone can't be the carry because then no one can carry. Have you had games where you've been stubborn and you've picked something like Froki or Cinderace in lane and been like, man, I really can't do anything. The reason for that is you are hurting your team and your teammates likely are too. If you're all attackers, there's no one there to enable the attackers. Attackers can't do it all on their own. As I said, watch the roles video. It's really important to know your roles. Let's talk about a really basic meta team I've seen going around the ladder at the moment and what everything in this team does. What does it actually offer and what is its value and why is it being chosen? Now, of course, Mew Mime and Glaceon are being chosen right now because they are absurdly overtuned and something needs to be done about them. But eventually we will see that happen and there will be other Pokemon taking their spots. But that doesn't mean that all they offer to a team is the fact that they're broken, that they do actually have utility and they do actually fill a role. For example, Mime is just undoubtedly the best support at the moment. It can heal your team, it can increase their damage, and it can also CC the opponent. CC is crowd control. It can stun them and it can slow them. Mime's Unite move is really impactful in a team fight. It does a lot of damage and it also stops the enemy team from moving. 
This is a really good tool to enable your team. Now, even if MIME's numbers go down and the damage numbers are nowhere near as high, this is still very valuable and MIME will likely still see some play. Its role as a support is something that it fills incredibly well. Now let's talk about Mew. Mew is a lane attacker with incredible secure. Getting Solar Beam or even Electro Ball at level 1 is really, really valuable. The Pokemon also scales really well into the late game, doing a lot of poke damage from far. Mew's weakness is it can't rip objectives that well. Mew's basic attacks are not very strong if its enhanced basic attack is not up. Now, Mime's ability to lower enemy special defense and keep them stunned in place really helps Mew get off that poke damage. Do you see how two of these Pokemon already enable each other so well? They're so valuable. They both have a strong early game and transition well into the late game. These are well-rounded characters. Then we look at Glaceon. Glaceon is running the jungle because you want that blue buff on your Glaceon. You want to be able to keep your abilities up at all times. Glaceon is very impactful burst damage. Now the downside to Glaceon is it's a very squishy Pokemon. It's very easy to take down, but it also will one-shot you if you come into sight. So even though Glaceon offers tremendous burst damage, it cannot do that without the Mime setting it up or say the Mew poking enemies out. With the Mime either protecting Glaceon or Mew or setting them up to do their damage, it really enables them to do their jobs. If Mime stuns an enemy, then Mew hits them with a Solar Beam, Glaceon can then come in clean up and wipe that enemy out. These three just work together incredibly. Now we look at Aegislash. Aegislash is one of the best top laners in the game at the moment. Its early game is really strong, its mid game is decent too, and in its late game it scales really well as like a secondary tank. It can really soak up damage and do really good damage at the same time. One thing it really offers to the team is its objective potential. Aegislash can secure the objectives in this map really, really well with its Unite move. It's very good at doing so, even with its boosted attacks. But it's not as simple as that. Aegislash actually also enables Glaceon a little more. It can get in and it can micro stun and knock up the enemy team and keep them distracted while Glaceon and Mew do damage from the back. Not only that, but it can also dive enemy Glaceons. It can actually soak up the damage of Mew and Glaceon with Wide Guard and it can get on those backliners and take them out. This is an incredible Pokemon that does its job way better than anything in its role can at the moment. And then we have Snorlax. Now, this isn't always going to be seen on teams, but it is a very good tool. Snorlax is another great way to separate and peel and engage in fights. The ability to knock enemies up with Heavy Slam and move them around with Block is incredible for team fights, and it's also great at pushing Regilecki into goals, defending it off yours, and helping with late game Rayquaza pushes. Snorlax is just a great all-rounded Pokemon that fits into the team really, really well. All of these Pokemon have really good early game secure. You have Pokemon like Age Slash that falls off a little into the late game, but Glaceon really picks it up at the end. So this team has great synergy. It's strong at all points of the match. Now, there are a lot of team compositions that work in similar ways. It's all about identifying what is your win condition and what is the strongest Pokemon at doing that for you at the moment. Do you want to build a team around Tyranitar or then you should likely run a Blissey on your team because it's really going to enable that to be a better Pokemon. Now this transitions into Solar Queue really well as well. If you say that your team has four attackers, peaking Tyranitar is a massive throw on your part. You've almost lost the game in character select because there is nothing to enable your Tyranitar. You have nothing to help you. You're just going to be running into the enemy without any sustain or backup in the fight while four backliners are either going to get backlined or try to back you up as you end up falling, you would be better off fulfilling that role with something a little stronger or something a little different. Perhaps a defender would actually be the choice for you here to really help you win the game. If you still want damage, there's options like Mamoswine and Trevenant as well. Now there are so many possible team compositions that you can build and a lot of them are really strong. But keeping with the theme of the basic series, I don't want to go into too much detail and overwhelm you with too much information. I hope this video helped explain the basics of a team comp and why people choose what they choose and what you could pick to maybe have better success, not just in your teams, but in your solo queue games as well. It's really important to look at what a team needs and to find the Pokemon that will really help that out. Not everyone can be the carry because then no one can carry. It's important to remember that. So as always guys, thank you so much for watching, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and have a wonderful day.